Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate Department occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and to pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Today, we're returning to one of our hardcore topics, you might call it. Over the decades that we've been running the occasional lecture series, public administration has been one of our central interests. And I thought it was high time that we return to it today. And uh, I'm thrilled to have today Jane Halton, AO PSM, Secretary of the Department of Finance, but of course, previously Secretary of the Department of Health, here today to address us. Jane is both the Dean and Doyen of the core of Departmental Secretaries, being the longest serving of the current crop of secretaries. And uh, she's had a, a fantastic career, highly respected and regarded. And uh, you could say, I guess, she's probably sick of these jokes about moving from a poacher to gamekeeper, moving from a, a spending department to a central agency. But I thought that if there was a, a theme song for her previous role as De uh, Secretary of the Department of Health in Hey Big Spender, the challenge for us today might be to come up with a, an appropriate theme song for her current role. So I might leave that little challenge with you and any bright ideas you're very welcome to inject into the proceedings at the conclusion of Jane's lecture. She's going to talk to us about reforming the public sector, always a topic of, of great interest, but particularly recently with the passage of the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act to replace the previous public governance legislation. So I do not want to take up any more of your time. I would like you to uh, turn your mobile phones to silent if you haven't already done so. And I'd like you to give a big hand to Jane Halton. Thank you. A momentary pause where I had to check mine was on silent, but it was. Um, thank you. And can I thank you for the invitation to, to give this occasional address? I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose lands we meet and to pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'm now going to spend half of my brain wondering what that song is. But you can tell me what you come up with. I've already got one very bad choice, just rattling around. Reform is a word that is overused, and I would argue even abused. So when we hear the word, I think we should get a little bit suspicious of overpromise and under-delivering. And I think that's a sensible state. I have quite a simple rule. If you want to know what something actually means, go to the dictionary. Um, I think it often helps calm things down. And reform in my old Oxford dictionary says, is making something better by removal of imperfections, faults or errors. People can reform, as can institutions and procedures. Who are we, who we are, I should say, and the way we govern, how we do things, these can all be improved. But when they are reformed, the reach is deeper and the impact longer lasting. When you reform something, you do away with previous constraints and often build something new in its stead. Some reforms are risky because they take away or disrupt something that particular people or interests hold true and replace sometimes with something they don't like. Sometimes reforms do not deliver on their promise. So how we reform is important. In his Costa del Nightmares program, which was aired on a certain channel last week, Gordon Ramsay went into one family-run restaurant in Spain where he made massive change in a very short space of time using a lot of four-letter words. He sacked the chef, cleaned out the kitchen, redid the menu and transformed the look and feel of the whole business in his usual understated way. It seemed effective at first, new customers queued up around the block and the restaurant's takings rose dramatically. Then the camera crew left. Within a month, the British press was reporting that things at the restaurant had gone back to where they were before the Ramsey whirlwind went through. The restaurant's owners had reintroduced their own recipes and gone back to their old ways. 
Ramsey may have reformed in a narrow dictionary definition sense, but the changes did not produce lasting effect. Ramsey may have improved things, but he moved on. There was no buy-in from the owners, let alone the sacked chef, no follow-up, no embedding of the changes that Ramsey made. The lesson from this is that for reform to be successful, you actually need to take people with you and ensure that change is truly embedded in systems and structures. Otherwise, good ideas will inevitably be lost through poor implementation. Now, contrast Gordon Ramsay with Peter the Great, 300 years before. He also wanted to reform a family-run business, but in this case his own, the governing of Imperial Russia. Now, of course, this is an historical example that occurred in an overall environment of oppression, imperial excess and ruthless military expansion, which of course would be unpalatable by modern standards, although I do think you can draw a parallel uh, with Gordon Ramsay. And like Gordon Ramsay, Peter the Great was given to the odd grand gesture. He imposed a tax on long beards of the nobility, for example, because they symbolised the backwardness of a Russia that was resisting his Europeanisation of the country. And I don't want to give my colleagues in Treasury any ideas, but in building a new fiscal base for government, Peter the Great also taxed other cultural customs like bathing and beekeeping. Peter introduced systematically and over two decades sweeping sweeping administrative and economic reforms, many of which lasted for almost 200 years until the Russian Revolution. Peter persevered with his reforms, unfolding them over a period of more than 20 years, embedding them through new laws, structures and people. He brought in a new generation of technocrats with professional skills who were committed to the new way of doing things. Being royal, he also used patronage to secure loyalty to his new order in a way, of course, that would be completely unacceptable in a modern, accountable system of democratic government. Fortunately, ethics and accountability in public administration have moved along a little bit. Like Gordon Ramsay, Peter the Great knew what needed to be done, but in contrast to the culinary superstar, he was pursuing lasting change, not 50 minutes of modest entertainment. So let me now draw the link between all of this and the public governance performance, I'm sure you were wondering, and accountability reforms that my department has led over the last few years and which I am here to talk about today. Reform, to be successful, needs to work at many levels. It needs to work with people and culture it, to ensure that hearts and minds are behind the changes proposed. It can only work if the right technology and enabling platforms are in place to support the implementation of change. And it can only succeed if resources are properly focused and performance expectations clearly articulated in terms of the outcomes and the impact sought. Lasting reform depends on people and resources being lined up between good behind good ideas and proper accountability structures being put in place for the long haul. Reforms last when they're based on good ideas and there is a clear value proposition about the case for change. A clear value proposition that is championed by people of influence from the top, if you like, is one that is most likely to drive along a lasting, a sustainable reform. The Finance Minister, Matthias Cormann, has expressed this government's aspiration for a more efficient public sector that is performance driven and can provide faster service to support Australia's pr prosperity into the future. The Prime Minister and the Communications Minister have both championed improving how Australians interact with government over the internet which has led to the recent establishment of the Digital Transformation Office. And as I know you're an audience who love acronyms, henceforth the DTO. And in various parliamentary committees, especially the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit, there have, has been bipartisan uh, discussion about how we improve accountability for how public resources are used and the achievement of public policy goals. So there is a convergence 
of political interest that provides a value proposition for the reforms that my department has been working on. An agile, modern, connected and responsive public sector that is accountable for what it does and how it does it. Happily, uh, that beaten dictionary of mine gives simple meanings to each of these key words. They actually mean what you think they mean on face value. And when you think about the growing interconnectivity of the big issues that challenge us as a community and the approaches that go to managing them, then you think about the increasing scarcity of and certainly the contestability uh, for public resources. Then you can see that unless the public sector adapts quickly, it will be left behind from where its key stakeholders want it to be. Reforming the Commonwealth public sector to achieve this change is a big job. Partly, this is because the Commonwealth itself is big and diverse. This year, we will spend around $430 billion. The public sector consists of more than 190 separate entities and companies, hundreds of boards and committees, and a large number of subsidiaries and other arrangements. Reforming the Commonwealth is also a big job because it involves cultural change, technology transformation, and rethinking the design of many existing programs and services. Reform on the scale that we're talking about has many different elements and many parties working on related initiatives. But my focus today is on what the Department of Finance is doing and how we're going about it and what we hope to achieve as a result. Now, the operations of the Commonwealth, and many people in this audience know this extremely well, have been governed by three financial governance frameworks over 115 years. The first one lasted for a particularly long time, 96 years to be precise. The current financial government framework, governance framework is contained in the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Act, which was enacted by the Parliament in June of 2013. And again, with acronyms, I'll refer to this as the PGPA. It replaced two pieces of legislation called the Financial Management and Accountability Act, the FMA Act, and the Commonwealth Authorities and Companies Act, known by everyone as the CAC Act, which my children when they were younger used to think was hysterically funny, which between them constituted the Commonwealth's second financial framework and divided government into two camps. Now, I don't really want to be reductionist in the characterisation that follows, because the range of governance arrangements, uh, operational requirements, including commercial ones, statutory obligations and accountabilities for performance in the Commonwealth are varied, nuanced and complex. Having said that, and talking in broad terms about the two camps under the previous financial framework helps to explain why particular changes were made under the PGPA Act. In one camp, the FMA Act camp, uh, it, and it consisted largely of departments and agencies that were directly accountable to ministers, were usually headed by a single person, were largely budget funded and legally constituted the Commonwealth of Australia. Many of these uh, features naturally constrain what these organisations can do, even under the new PGPA Act. They cannot, for example, uh, enter contracts in their own name or bank in their own name, and they're subject to government policies in a range of areas. However, in addition to these natural constraints, the former framework imposed even more process controls over organisations in the first camp. Uh, there was an appropriate and strong emphasis on the proper use of public property uh, that was in their hands. However, this was achieved through detailed process controls around money appropriated by the parliament and how it was drawn down, managed and spent. The old framework said very little about the governance requirements of these organisations and said nothing about risk management and their performance obligations. Now, life was quite different in the second camp or the CAC Act camp. This is where organisations that were corporate in their nature, including Commonwealth companies, were placed. Uh, they have governing boards, 
their own legal personality and usually a high degree of operational independence under their enabling legislation. The CAC framework did set down some core governance and reporting standards, including the duties of directors and the senior executive, but set no standards for the proper use of public property. There were very few, few controls about how organisations in the second camp managed and spent the money they held, even if it was appropriated by the parliament. And there was little to remind these bodies that, independent though they are in many respects, they owe accountability to the parliament and the people about how they run their affairs. Life in the second camp was largely governed by principles. As a result, organisations were more likely to innovate with stronger risk management and strategic planning practices. Life in the first camp was constrained by detailed rules, not just from the finance department, but from departments and agencies across the system. Here, you were less likely to find innovation, strong risk management and strategic planning practices. And to make it even more complicated, you had some highly independent statutory bodies placed in the first camp and some mainstream core government activities in the second. So you had camp crossing behaviour. People in the first camp were desperate to pitch their tents in the second camp because they saw fewer rules and controls from the centre. And there was a prejudice for creating new bodies under the CAC Act for this very reason. Even where, for example, the type of role that the organisation played or for governance or accountability reasons, it was more appropriate to have mainstream government functions under the FMA Act. Finance played the role of boundary rider, I know, because they used to shoot at me when I tried to cross camps. Caught up in debates that focused on the impact of prescriptive rules, reporting requirements and red tape on their business than on the right structure of a public entity playing a particular role. It's not surprising that these debates were conducted with passion. I can attest to that. The finance people involved in reviewing the previous financial framework still recall their discomfort when some Commonwealth regulatory bodies that moved from the CAC Act regime to the FMA Act uh, space ran them through the costly changes the transition forced them to make to their internal business and reporting systems with absolutely no benefit to the quality of their operations. I sort of wonder why we did it to ourselves. So in a context where government is interested in improved cohesion, more agility, more innovation and stronger governance, performance and accountability standards, we had at the whole of system level a Commonwealth public sector that over time had grown apart in ways that made a coherent reform journey quite difficult. So one of the core aims of the reform process that was actually launched in 2010, which actually led to the PGP Act being passed, was to bring cohesion and a single set of principles into play for all Commonwealth entities. Whether they were non-corporate uh, or corporate entities, whether they were statutory bodies or government business enterprises. And it took over two years uh, to get to the point where we could even consider drafting legislation. Policy development process included 13 issues papers, a discussion paper, a separate position paper, meetings with every Commonwealth entity. I could go on. The private sector, um, third sector and professional peak bodies, state governments, academics, former public sector leaders. There was an extensive process of consultation. Ministers and parliamentary committees endorsed the final reform package before it was debated in the parliament. It was a Peter the Great approach rather than 50 minutes of high-octane television. Although, as my now colleagues say, there were pressure points in the process that saw colourful Ramsey-esque moments, I know, because I was party to a number of them. The PGPA Act approach is principles-based, which is pretty innovative in terms of international practice. And there are five principles uh, which underpin the Act and the, the reforms that accompany it. One, government should operate as a coherent whole. Two, a uniform set of duty should apply to all resources handled by Commonwealth entities. Three, the performance of the public sector is more than financial. Four, engaging with risk is a necessary step in improving performance. Five, that the financial framework should support 
the legitimate requirements of the government and the parliament in discharging their respective duties. So let me deal with the first two and explain how they come together. That government should act as a coherent whole is in my view, a no, uh, it's a no brainer, but sometimes it's actually quite difficult to achieve. To the extent that the previous framework made this difficult, we've, had, we've made some significant changes in the PGPA Act that should make it easier. And we've done this by taking good ideas from the former FMA Act and the CAC Act, applying them broadly and then supplementing them with new provisions. The core philosophy in the PGPA Act is that public resources are public resources, no matter whose hands they're in. Believe it or not, this is actually a new, Commonwealth, uh, new concept in Commonwealth legislation. Under the PGPA Act, all Commonwealth entities are accountable for the proper use of the resources that they hold, no matter how it came to be in their hands, whether through appropriations, commercial activities, levies, charges, taxes, cost recovery, or some donation. There is a common definition for public resources. Public resources consist of appropriations which are defined in the Constitution and relevant money and relevant property which are defined in the PGPA Act. All public resources are to be used and managed properly. Again, proper use and management of public resources is defined in the PGPA Act. It means efficient, effective, economical and ethical and for non-corporate entities that constitute part of the Australian Government, it also means used and managed in a way that is not inconsistent with the policies of the government. This standard for proper use is drawn from the previous FMA Act that applied to that first camp I described, but it is now applied to all of us as public sector officials. Each Commonwealth entity has officials who are broadly speaking, the persons who are or form part of the entity and we as officials handle public resources. The PGPA Act lays out in sections 25 to 29 the general duties that officials must observe when they do this, including care and diligence, acting honestly in good faith and for a proper purpose. These general duties are drawn from the previous CAC Act that applied to more senior people in that second camp I described, but it now applies to all of us in the public sector, all us public servants. For those familiar with the duty, duties in corpse law and corporations law, the duties in the PGPA Act are actually quite similar. And in addition to the general duties that apply to all officials, there are additional duties on accountable authorities. So an accountable authority, broadly speaking, is the person who heads a non-corporate commonwealth entity. A secretary, for example, like myself, or the board that governs a corporate Commonwealth entity, like the board of the CSIRO or Australia Post. So as the Secretary of Finance, I am subject to those general duties on officials in the PGPA, which I just described, and the duties of an accountable authority that are spelled out in sections 15 to 19 of the Act. These duties include promoting the proper use and management of public resources for which I am responsible, including through establishing and maintaining appropriate systems of risk oversight and internal controls within my department. I can also issue under section 20A of the Act, written instructions about how the officials in my department handle relevant money or public resources in general. All accountable authorities are responsible for promoting the achievement of the purpose of their entity and its financial sustainability, and to give information to their minister and the finance minister on particular things. In my case, the finance minister is my minister. You might say this is somewhat unremarkable. Of more interest might be the following two provisions. So under section 15.2 of the Act, an accountable authority has to take account of the effective decisions that it makes on public resources generally. This means that the accountable authority has to consider how the actions and policies they pursue will affect other entities individually and collectively and public resources generally. This works both ways, in the positive and in the negative. So it opens us up to sharing better ways of working together, 
between Commonwealth entities because accountable authorities have to think beyond the boundaries of their own organisation in assessing the value proposition of some decision that they're making. It covers decision making that might have particular benefits to the entity in question, but has broader negative implications for other entities or public resources generally. So you can't do something that advantages yourself, which might seriously disadvantage one of your colleagues. An example would be an entity that pursues its own policy, uh, for example, imposing uh, unnecessary red tape costs on others, or by in imposing charges that cross subsidise their own operations. A related concept can be found in Section 57 of the Public uh, Service Act, which talks about the role of departmental secretaries in providing stewardship across the Australian public service. The next interesting concepts, in my view, um, are in sections 17 and 18 of the Act. These sections came about because those who worked with the Commonwealth, commercial partners, the community sector and states and territories, told us uh, that partnering with the Commonwealth could be a really bad experience. Broadly speaking, what they said was, um, we have the money to get things done, but we were risk averse and afraid to innovate. Our thinking was dominated by fear of failure rather than the prospect of breakthrough success. We pushed risk onto other parties and micromanaged how the other side would fill their side of the bargain. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Given that information, innovation in public policy involves engaging with risk, finding new ways of doing things, backing good ideas and putting faith in others, this was criticism that went to the core of our aspiration to move down the road of that agile, modern, connected and responsive Commonwealth public sector. So Section 17 places a positive duty on an accountable authority to cooperate with others to achieve common objectives where practicable. This recognises that Commonwealth entities do not exist in isolation, in a vacuum. Effective collaboration between Commonwealth entities with other levels of government and with the private and not-for-profit sectors is critical to the achievement of many of the government's priorities and national goals. The Commonwealth needs to partner with others. This section says, in effect, we expect you to do it if it is the right thing to do. Long-term disadvantage, chronic health issues, improved education outcomes, domestic security, are all issues where the COAG has committed to doing more and where joined up government and a joined up community are part of the solution. From exploring more innovative funding models to trying new governance and accountability models, we have a lot of work to do on this front. While the PGPA Act unblocks some of the legal and technical issues in this space, I acknowledge that there are some, these are some of the key challenges uh, which we need to address if we're going to sort out some of the challenges facing our community, including those being explored in the Federation White Paper. So I might now turn to risk, uh, a subject about which there has been much debate. And the section of the PGPA, the next section, 18, um, which covers this says, when you do join up, think carefully about the requirements you place on others in relation to management and the use of resources, you need to think about risk. I explained earlier that one of the underlying principles is that engaging with risk is a necessary step in improving performance. All major public policy involves risk, but risk can be identified and strategies can be developed in consultation with ministers and other stakeholders to handle it. We cannot afford another failure like the home insulation program when negligible effort was put into understanding the operating environment for the rollout. But neither can we afford government programs that don't innovate or sensibly push boundaries at all because they are designed to exclude even the most immaterial risks. The PGPA Act says, think about the risks involved and how you are managing those risks. In the arrangements, you negotiate with others, but don't load your partners with red tape just because you want to cover your bases if something goes wrong. 
Section 18 of the PGPA Act puts the onus on accountability, accountable authorities, me and my colleagues, to assess the risks in relation to the public resources involved in a joined up enterprise and then place proportionate obligations on those who are joining up with, they are joining up with. So it's taking measured risk, not being reckless. For example, an established community sector grant recipient with proven credentials and a strong track record of delivery in an established area of operations could have a different level of reporting obligations placed on them than, say, a new organisation venturing into a new and unknown area. But equally, accountable authorities should engage with risk sensibly and not avoid traversing into a new area just because it involves risk. The proposition is that, if, that it should be done, but done sensibly or in PGPA language. An accountable authority should establish and maintain an appropriate system of risk oversight and management to promote the achievement of the purposes of the entity. To support better risk practice in the Commonwealth, we've issued the first ever Commonwealth Risk Management Policy, which sets the principles to underpin better risk management in the day-to-day -day operations uh, and decision-making processes of Commonwealth entities. More sophisticated and nuanced risk management on the part of Commonwealth entities uh, might actually help us get down that path of more innovative and agile delivery and, can I say, less red tape. My department will work very closely over the next few years with both the Australian Public Service and all Commonwealth entities to promote better risk planning and more positive risk engagement in the activities of national government. But we are learning how to do this. The PGPA Act contains many other provisions. Like other financial management legislation, it lays out the basis on which appropriations are released, talks about who has banking and investment powers, the scope of those powers and how they can be exercised. It sets the framework for granting of indemnities, warranties and guarantees, the gifting of relevant property and the custody of money. It establishes a legal basis for non-corporate uh, entities to enter into arrangements and commitments and how ministers approve expenditure. Importantly, it also provides the framework for rules around the management of procurement, grants, fraud and financial reporting. A particular area that my department is working on now is in the area of improving public accountability by having better performance reporting to both the parliament and the public through the introduction of corporate plans and enhancements to annual reports. For the first time, all Commonwealth entities are required to produce and publish a corporate plan, and this is meant to be done by the 31st of this month. Corporate plans are to outline the purposes of each entity, what it will do to achieve those purposes, what environmental risks and resource issues it will have to deal with, and how it will measure and report on its success. They'll have a four-year time horizon and be updated every year. And at the conclusion of each operating year, each entity will issue in a statement in their annual report um, an explanation of how they performed against their corporate plan. I said earlier that this was about performance. And I like to think of corporate plans and annual reports as bookends of the performance story. So there really are two principles in the PGPA Act that are performance of the public sector, uh, that it's more than financial, and that the financial framework should support the government and the parliament in discharging their respective duties. It will take time to improve performance reporting, but I'm pleased to say that the Commonwealth public sector is determined to have a good go at this. Community of practice meetings and seminars have been organised in Canberra and of course uh, across the country to allow entities to learn from each other and from international practice. We're also running pilot projects to test particular approaches to improving performance information. And all governments, I should acknowledge, uh, struggle on this front. But it would certainly be satisfying for me and certainly for my department if we can improve the quality of the performance information that we publish in a way, and we're certainly helping, hoping that we can help others do the same. In the very little time I've got left, I just want to return to what I described earlier as the clear value proposition for the reforms that my department has been working on. Agile, modern, connected and responsive public sector. 
Uh, the government has asked us to work on redoing the menu, cleaning out the kitchen, transforming the look and feel of the business of government with no entertainment value, but with the intent for systemic, systemic reform. During the 2015 budget, the government announced an agenda to transform the public sector with contestability reviews, shared services and smaller government initiatives all playing a role. And looking at government activities and services through a contestability lens encourages Commonwealth entities to adopt a more commercial mindset and to seek ways of improving the performance of existing or proposed government functions. The contestability program, which is being led by my department, is using this prospect of competition to encourage public servants to ask three quite simple questions. Do we need to do this? How well do we do this? Are we best placed to deliver this? In the pilot phase of this program, savings of over 200 million were identified in the functional and efficiency reviews of the Departments of Health and the Department of Education and Training. And my thanks to the secretaries of both those departments for being very willing and active participants in that pilot. Encouraged by these results, the government has commissioned a further eight functional and efficiency reviews, and they'll look systematically at existing functions to assess their alignment with government priorities, and to see if an activity or service could be delivered by someone else to a higher quality standard or at a lower cost. We need to ask ourselves if performance can be improved through alternative structures, processes or provider arrangements. The smaller government initiative is about clarifying lines of accountability and cutting waste and duplication while improving efficiency and focus of the public service. Since the announcement of the smaller government agenda, an estimated $1.4 billion of savings have been av made available to fund other policy priorities. And the number of government bodies will reduce by 286 by consolidation, abolition, replacement, and in the case of Medibank Private, successful privatisation led by my department. And while the changes announced to date amount to a significant reduction in the number of government bodies, there is not an equivalent contraction in government functions. This is because a number of the reforms involve consolidation into departments or larger entities, as well as the merger of smaller bodies to link together related functions. Embedding best practice across the Commonwealth is likely to be expedited by other work we're doing in this area, including in uh, sharing common services. We're standardising processes and infrastructure where possible and sharing transactional functions to leverage scale and scope to increase efficiency. So an example of this kind of work um, is bringing common functions together in centres of excellence. And in this way, a few entities will provide services for many. And a good example of this, many of you would be aware of it, I'm sure, is the Shared Services Centre, which is a, part, uh, a, a partnership between the Departments of Education and Training and Employment. And what it does is it leverages economies of scale to provide competitively priced core human resources and finance systems and other more specialised services. And they're actually uh, providing now that service to a number of different agencies around town. We're also looking at the consolidation of standardised systems to the, to the cloud and consolidation of common non-transactional processes and supporting a larger range of common services such as in relation to enterprise resource planning systems with minimal customisation. So I say in my department, um, it's not about different and special. A key factor driving more uh, efficient government operations is the rise of new technology options. And for the majority of people and businesses, the internet is their preferred method of interacting with government. Despite being a pioneer of the internet, the Commonwealth public sector is now really playing a bit of catch up to the best in the private sector. And the community now wants government services and programs that are available anytime and anywhere on any device. I bet some of you are playing with your mobile phones as we speak personalised to reflect their particular requirements and delivered faster at a lower cost. So the government's aiming uh, to do significant work in this area. You would know that the digital uh, transformation agenda is uh, a significant one and with a goal that by 2017, major transactions between citizens and government uh, are digital from end to end. So there's a lot of catching up for us to do. Government information 
is now published across more than 1,200 disparate .gov.au websites, plus a range of social media accounts, apps and other digital formats. The evolution of distribution of this information reflects the silos in which government operates and the very silos the PGPA Act has sought to break down. The fact is that people largely don't care how government organises itself, they just want government to work. And the Digital Transformation Office, the DTO, has been created to lead uh, the government in transforming our services to improve the experience of Australians dealing with government. The DTO is working closely with individuals, businesses and industries to identify opportunities for improvement and redesign government services from a user perspective. And the DTO is working with all of us, all the government entities, to help us plan our transformation, to provide users with a better experience when dealing with government and deliver public services across all channels. The Department of Communications has estimated productivity gains of up to $600 million could be achieved through improved digital capa capability for public servants and citizens and business. And the UK Cabinet Office has done research in this space and what it shows is, in general, a digital transaction is 20 times cheaper than one by phone, 30 times cheaper than one by post and 50 times cheaper than a face-to-face -face transaction. Digital transactions are also simpler and that people don't have to wait in a call centre queue or travel to a shop front or government office to transact their business. Now I accept, uh, of course, for a range of reasons, not all transactions will, uh, with government will lend themselves to web-based solutions, but there is significant scope to improve on this front. So, will all these things combine to reach deep enough and deliver changes that will be sufficiently long-lasting to constitute reform? Are we really doing away with previous constraints and building something new in their stead? I believe we are. It will take time to transform how the Commonwealth public sector works, but we have shifted the frameworks and clarified the concepts that underpin Commonwealth operations under the PGPA Act. We have created an environment we're asking questions about what we are doing and how we're doing it, and whether we can do it with others or let others do it for us, are proper questions to ask. This is not a 50-minute television show. Although I'd like to finish by quoting Gordon Ramsay with no four-letter words, you'll all be pleased to know, from the Costa del Nightmares episode I mentioned at the beginning. Berating kitchen management practices of the Mayfair restaurant on the Costa del Sol, he said, you can't just buy fresh, fresh produce and stick it on top of the old stuff. The same goes for lasting reform. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. That was a, a fascinating account and very inspiring, I must say so. Not to be Gordon Ramsay, I hope. No. <laughs> um, Jane has kindly agreed to take questions. If you have a question, you uh, might like to put your hand up and we'll pass a microphone to you. But if I might kick off. A freer operating environment is a great idea. We need to invest, however, to make the digital transformations, yeah. all those other things. And I would just be interested in your thoughts philosophically on how a concept like the efficiency dividend, which bedevils small agencies like mine, mm. sits with those principles in the PGPA Act. Mm. So, I mean, the, the efficiency dividend has been a feature of how we've all run public sector organisations for years, and I have personally railed against it um, to assorted ministers and various other people. Uh, there is a conversation to be had about how we make investment choices, and certainly there is a more sophisticated discussion to be had about what mechanisms we can use to get resources to reinvest in activity. Now, at the moment, we use 
uh, the efficiency dividend and efficiency dividend savings are taken and effectively reinvested. So I think it's a conversation we need to have and certainly there is a debate going on inside my department about what other mechanisms you can use to harness and to drive the ongoing need for efficiency um, at the same time as actually enabling people to invest. So I mean, I think you raise an important point. It was something we're very conscious of and certainly something we have been discussing. I don't have the answer to that yet, I'm sorry. But it, and you made the point rightly about the impact on small agencies. Uh, I would observe that uh, both uh, sides of politics, when they've been in government, have acknowledged on a number of occasions the particular challenge of small agencies because uh, obviously if you're running a very small agency, you capacity to even invest is quite uh, constrained. So I'm um, very aware of the problem and I, I think we need to continue to have that discussion. Obviously any views you've got would be extremely welcome. Mm. It, it is a, a very, very difficult yes, uh, I issue. Uh, before I get the microphone to you, sir, I'll just risk one more contribution. It's always been my dream to come up with the parliamentary equivalent, the merchandising equivalent of B1 and B2. Now. <laughs> Under PGPA, would I be allowed to keep the profits? <laughs> well, of course, we, we, we do have a variety of policies, don't we, about cost recovery, and then there's a negotiation to be had. So it depends on how successful B1 and B2 are. Yes, if they're incredibly successful, we may have to take a dividend, Rosemary. Oh, possibly. <laughs> yes. So you have a question. Do you see the uh, current length of uh, government term of three years to be a hindrance to, to, for you implementing those far-reaching uh, policies and the second question is do you think the Commons have a need to have something like the New South Wales uh, Independent Commission Against Corruption? So, so look, I mean, if I were at sitting at Senate Estimates, what I would say is, um, you're asking me for an opinion, Senator, we don't give opinions. Um, so I'll give you that answer to start with. C can I say that as the public service, we work uh, inside the framework which is decided by the Parliament. Uh, we work in the context of three-year terms of government and we work in the context of the uh, institutions that are agreed to by the Parliament. So in terms of the reform agenda that I talked about, uh, that's a reform agenda that will continue. It's now an act of Parliament and we will be pursuing the nature of the reforms that I've described today. Uh, through those three-year terms of government. But obviously, uh, we, will, we will have to manage uh, that transition, taking account of the pace of reform that's possible and taking account of the lessons we will learn. Uh, I talked about performance reporting. I talked about the, the need for corporate plans. Corporate plans are something which departments of state have never done before. Um, we are doing our first one as the Department of Finance and my officials who are preparing the corporate plan versus my officials who have been giving this advice to the rest of the service um, gave it a qualified bronze medal, which I thought was pretty high praise from them actually. But my, I guess my message is this is not a short run thing, this reform, and the length of a parliamentary term is something we will just continue through. I, well, as I said, I don't give opinions about uh, institutions, their decisions for the parliament. Yes, Phil. Uh, Jane. Ah, I, that sounds like the parliamentary budget officer. <laughs> Thank you. Not that I can recognise you. Actually, would you people can't. mind introducing themselves? Because I actually can't see faces. Okay, Phil Bowen, uh, head of the parliamentary budget office. Jane, thank you for your talk. Uh, very interesting, very informative. Uh, made a, what is often a dull subject, quite, uh, quite lively. I'll take that so as So thank price. you for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've, you've made a quite compelling case, I think, for the reforms that your department is leading. My question goes to um, the red tape reduction yeah. that you briefly yes. mentioned. Yeah. Could you give us an update of how that process is proceeding uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, the impact it may have in alleviating the compliance burden that is currently uh, put upon small agencies in particular? Uh, thank, thanks, Phil. 
Bill, and obviously in a, in a speech of that nature, it's, it's hard to go to every um, issue that's relevant, but this is an incredibly important issue. For those who don't know, we're currently doing an internal uh, red tape review. That review has been conducted by Barbara Belcher, um, a very distinguished former public servant who's probably known to a good number of you. And she um, is in the process of finalising that report. In fact, I hosted a meeting, uh, I think it was Monday, anyway, this week, of the Secretary's uh, Committee on Transformation, which again, for those of you who aren't aware of that, most of you would be aware there's a Secretary's Board and we have a subcommittee of the Secretary's Board called the Secretary's Committee on Transformation, which I am chairing and enables us to come together and to work in a collaborative way around issues of the common interest, the things I was just describing in that speech. And we uh, had a meeting which enabled us to review a draft of that report. And not surprisingly, uh, Barbara has found a huge number of things, which my department does as much as other people do, but there are things right across the internal workings of government, which she has identified as opportunities to sweep away red tape. So that uh, discussion was a discussion of, have we got it right? Have we missed things? Uh, are there issues? Uh, is any of this wrong? Uh, it was a very good meeting, and I'm very hopeful that she will be in a position to finalise that report in the fairly near future. Uh, there's another comment I'd make though, Phil, about red tape, and yes, I think it will alleviate some of the, I think quite a deal of the compliance burden, but obviously what we'll do is when we get the report, we'll roll it out, and then we will actually collectively, I think, and I hope, review whether there's more we can do in the medium term. But the other comment I'd make about red tape, and I think this is important, one of the things I'm constantly astounded by when it comes to red tape is how people make things up. So people um, decide that there is a particular re compliance requirement which appears nowhere in any chief executive instructions or in any piece of legislation, and then it becomes a matter of holy writ that you have to do something this particular way. So whilst we are going to do things about the rules and the red tape in the rules. One of the messages I'm giving my colleagues, and in fact, I'm talking about this in my department because I have found a number of examples of this in my department, where people say to me, I need to do such and such before I actually procure on a credit card for something that's under $100. Now, it's just not right. And we can sweep away a lot of that misunderstanding as well as red tape, I would hope, in this exercise. Uh, because there have been a number of steps taken over the last few years which should make it easier for people to transact government business in a thoroughly proper and accountable way uh, without going through unnecessary administrative overhead and hoops. So we'll go to the actual red tape and then I'm asking other people to go to the made up and mythical red tape while they're at it. Very good point. Further questions or suggestions for theme songs? I, I hesitate to mention um, my thought, which was the thought bubble, that um, song from the musical Oliver. Oh, that's what I thought. Yes, Dear idea. well. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Who's John? Got... Yeah. There's someone in the middle too. Yes. And then we'll go into the middle. Okay. Uh, John Halligan, University of Canberra. Uh, Hello, Jane. Uh, sometimes reform is talked about as uh, programs of action or ob objectives, but of course that doesn't amount to very much. I think it's really uh, in terms of impacts, which I think was what you were saying towards the end. But of course the big question is implementation. So how will you and we know uh, that the impacts are actually occurring? I mean, how do you define success, you know, through monitoring or whatever? Thank you. Um, so look, that, that's in a number of ways. I mean, objectively, there are a number of things that are required under the Act. Uh, so the requirement for corporate plans. So there are a number of actual physical, you know, institutional things you have to do and things you have to produce. And obviously there's a very simple metric here, which is, did you do it? Uh, but the, the, the valuable part, the qualitative and quantitative part, which I think is the thing which is the real reform here, is can we see improvement uh, in the transparency, in the accountability, and in the ability for people, ordinary people, not people who read fluent acronym, to actually tell whether we are getting better at doing the things that we're charged with, which is to deliver government policy. 
Uh, so our job as the public sector is to be transparent and accountable, and it is to uh, find ways to measure, monitor, etc., what we do. And that enables the community to debate about whether we're doing that well. So uh, we, we have a couple of internal processes. So my department is responsible for managing, monitoring, reporting on you know, to the minister, etc., which we are doing. But I talked about the Secretary's Committee on Transformation earlier. The thing that I am uh, really, really delighted about is when I went to the secretaries and said, the new legislation brings with it an obligation for us to work together in a way, and you kindly describe me as the doyen, but I am certainly the dean of the secretary's call, in a way which has not been a feature of uh, how we've run the agency called the Australian Public Service. Now, the enormous enthusiasm and willingness of my colleagues to come together, to work on shared and common services, to look to see how we can work uh, better together and how we can learn these lessons, I have been absolutely delighted with. So I think you'll see objective uh, things, you'll see some of the measurement and monitoring, uh, and then I hope you will also see uh, an approach to working together, which while you can't measure it, uh, will, I hope, deliver measurable differences. There's someone in the middle. Was there a we hand in the middle? Hand up. Yes, yes here. Tim. Thanks. Uh, James Graham, Australian Government Solicitor. Um, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'd just like to ask a question about the uh, the risk issue. Um, the, it seems to me that there are, are two particularly strong drivers of the, um, the risk aversion that's a problem. One is that um, the psychologists, the psychologists tell us people are bad at assessing risks mm -hmm. and very bad at appreciating that their assessment is a gut feeling and not a um, careful analysis. The other thing is that um, our society generally is becoming more and more risk averse to the point where um, avoiding risks and being safe is something that people do almost instinctively without thinking about it. Um, in my work, one of the th things that um, the risks that we often have to I often have to avoid is something that, for example, might embarrass the minister. Um, given that, as I understand it, in order to be a minister, one has to have the height of a hippopotamus or no capacity for embarrassment at all. This has always seemed um, an odd risk to need to avoid. Um, but the, what I was wondering was whether the, the changes in the, um, in, in the new act, whether you think that these um, are sufficient to get people to try to overcome pressures like this, and if so, whether you, how long do you think it will take to work? Um, so in terms of some of those remarks, if I can quote Tony Jones, I'll take them as a comment. Um, look, I made a comment about, um, and I've been talking with staff across the APS about this, about the whole notion of risk. And, and as I've said to people, you can calibrate risk. And I take your point about individuals not necessarily being very good at individually calibrating. Um, I could go back, I mean, I did a psychology degree, let's be clear. <laughs> so I remember all of the research and I, I find that research very interesting. But we're not talking about in single individuals here. We're actually talking about institutions, um, actually thinking about managing, monitoring and calibrating risk. And interestingly, I think it actually gives you a better way to manage. Now, if I go back to an example of what I did in health, um, I changed the way we manage projects to actually calibrate how uh, much resource you spent on going back to those organisations, depending on how much risk there was. It's the example I gave in terms of grant recipients. Very established, well-known, long track record. You don't have to spend the same amount of time oversighting their activities as you do in a brand new area where there is uncertainty. So it's not about one individual's uh, inability to measure and monitor, because you're right, individuals can be sometimes not very good at that. It's about the institution thinking about what its risk framework is, what its risk appetite is, and then calibrating its use of resources. Now, interestingly, I think this also makes it easier for uh, administrators to talk with the ANAO about how they have used their resources, why we've done it this way. We've got a proper risk plan, we have calibrated. And as I said, when you engage with risk, it is not the same as being reckless. 
Reckless is about taking risks without thinking about it and just launching in and doing things. What we're talking about with risk in this framework is actually having a plan, considering everything you're doing, and then calibrating and measuring and monitoring appropriately. Now, your general point, it's new, yes. How long will it take to achieve? I wouldn't want to predict, but I can tell you, even in my organisation, but certainly in my former organisation, those conversations have gone from being um, intermittent to now being institutionalised, risk committees, people are actually thinking about risk. You're thinking about large institutional wide risk, as well as the micro risks that you're managing. Uh, you're actually making sure that your senior management team understand what those institutional-wide risks might be. So I wouldn't want to have a crystal ball out to tell you it'll all be s fixed in you know, two years. But what I can tell you is I can already see an improvement in maturity in this area. And we have to learn how to do this together. So I'm optimistic, actually, that we will be much more sophisticated in our management of risk. And if you look at some of our corporate commercial entities, they have been uh, much more practised at this. Uh, we need to catch up as departments of state with their activity. Thanks for the question. It's, I mean, it is a really important issue. I think that's probably an appropriate time uh, point to end on. Sadly, our hour is up. It's gone very quickly. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and contributing to a very interesting discussion. But above all, I'd like to th thank Jane for an excellent presentation and um, very, very timely to return to the topic of public administration. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank, thank you. you. Going back to check that our corporate plan will be ready by the 31st. <laughs>